the top three best factions in online play in the Total War Warhammer series. This video is going to make a few assumptions here with regards to the criteria that makes the fa some of the factions the best factions to play with. Now, I want to preface this whole conversation by saying for a skilled player, you can make just about any old faction work. There is no doubt about that. This game is actually very, very well balanced in the meta. I would say, but there are three factions that really do stand out with all other things being equal. So the criteria for this video is going to be a few different things. It's going to take into account the versatility of a particular army. How many different compositions can they can they realistically throw at you? It's going to be assuming, as we kind of span this battlefield over here, it's going to be assuming that we are going to be using large funds, not ultra funds, not normal funds, but just large funds, which I think is the most relatable, um, in a one versus one setting. And it's also going to assume that you have top level skill. So with that said, we'll start off with number three, the Dark Elves. The Dark Elves have so much versatility in the way that they can throw different army compositions at the enemy that it makes them very difficult to plan for when you know that you're going to be facing off against them. So I'm always thinking about this from the perspective of, you know, using them as an enemy, essentially. With the Dark Elves, they have very cost-effective units, meaning that they have all of the units that make sense at their tier level for a good price, especially against other uh, especially against other factions. So what do I mean by that? Well, I basically mean that for 500 gold spent on the Dark Elves, that seems to go further than 500 gold spent on, you know, some other faction like the Greenskins or the, or the Empire, for example. The Dark Elves have a decently well-rounded roster in general. They have, obviously, a lot of killing power. I wouldn't necessarily put them in the glass cannon um, uh, category, but they do have a lot of killing power that actually gains momentum as the game goes on. So once you get into, usually around the middle of a match, you'll proc what's called Murderous Mastery, and that will actually just increase their killing capabilities, which makes them... Even, which just makes them stronger is what it does. Of course, the Dark Elves have just about access to most, most lores of magic, so they have a lot of versatility there. Usually very difficult to plan for. And then also they do have a lot of access to different monsters, which are both of the flying and ground type and also hero and at will and also other monster killing types as well so they have tools to deal with everything everywhere so not only are they very difficult to plan for but they have a lot of a lot of different options to plan for well you if you're playing against them of course now when it comes down to it they have very good rush capabilities and i would say that that's probably the better way to be playing as them but they can stick back a little bit as well they do have one piece of artillery of course which can force the enemy to come to you although really if you're going to be playing the Dark Elves, it's the rushing capabilities that's going to make them a little bit better. Whenever you rush the enemy, which pretty much all of these top factions are going to be doing, <laughs> whenever you rush the enemy, you essentially force them to make decisions. And when you force someone to make decisions, you have opportunities to make them, to force them into errors, essentially. Now, of course, like I said, and I want to kind of harp on this point a little bit more, they have very good value for gold spent across their whole roster. Their top tier units in their Harganeth Executioners and their Black Guard of Nagarond are some of the best in the game and can compete at the top level on the ground with just about anyone else. On top of that, like I said, their monsters are incredibly serviceable. War Hydras, very cost effective to stick into a front line and use as just a front line disruptor. Charybdis can hunt out just about any other uh, enemy hero or lord or, or, or enemy monster for that matter as well. And of course, their lower tier units as well are very serviceable. The Dread Spears will have good staying power, even though they cost very minuscule amounts of gold. I believe it's 450. We can actually just check it right here. Yes, indeed it is been playing this game too much <laughs> but but the dark elves have have options everywhere which means that they have a full roster which means that you have many different ways to kind of spend that money which offers up again just a more versatile look which makes them more difficult to plan for and that is why they are certainly number three now with that i do want to finish on one last note 
the Dark Elves not only have all of what we just spoke about, but they do have damn good sort of skirmishing capabilities as well with their shades. Shades are are some of the biggest weapons, I do think, on their roster, essentially. And the reason why that is because you don't, first off, you don't know where they're going to be. They are they they can ambush rather well. And then also they have armor-piercing missiles, and they're also very good in melee combat as well. And that's and that's considering just the base shades. If you get them with great swords or with... Um, great swords or with dual weapons then you can just specialize them even that much more and that's still at a very cost effective measure as well so with all those different tools combined i do believe that the dark elves are solid at number three number two the wood elves the wood elves are certainly the most micro intensive faction in in the Warhammer universe that I've seen today. Now, this video is being recorded in, uh, in at the end of uh, May in the year 2020, so shout out to Corona Times. But but with the Wood Elves, as it is right now, they are rewarded with, with micro. With, with great micro comes great responsibility. And the Wood Elves are, I believe, the best faction for that. If you are that micro-intensive sort of player, they have the best ambushing capabilities. They have the best skirmishing capabilities. They have some of the most speed. And their killing power is immense as well. Where they do lack is their defense, but if you're going to be a rush and skirmish and essentially ambush type faction, well, do you really need defense? No, because the game needs to be balanced. But, but, but at the end of the day, they can set up very clever traps for the enemy. And because a lot of their units can Vanguard deploy as well and have incredible speed on top of that, and in some cases even fire while moving, they are very difficult to deal with and very difficult to plan for. Not only that, but they do have flying capabilities capabilities as well. Now, of course, they do lack in artillery capabilities, but that's not an issue when you have the range of the missile units that they do. I myself am not a missile player, but when I play, uh, uh, but if I am going to play as the Wood Elves, it actually is pretty rewarding. I just don't, I just don't like with the other factions really. And because of all the versatility within their unit and within their roster, it makes them ex incredibly deadly. Because not only do they have that sort of ambushing and and range capability with incredible killing power and armor piercing power on their range units, but their ground troops as well are rather cost effective. We do see on the on the low tier end these Eternal Guards are very good holding units. They can actually operate as a front line incredibly well for a very low price. On top of that, they do have, of course, some good killing opportunities with their with their ground units as well. Not necessarily the highlight of their roster, but they are very serviceable and gives the enemy a little bit more to think about. These war dancers will absolutely chop through most 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 uh, most low and medium tier armies. They will have absolutely no problem with that. Of course, they do lack in the armor department, as I said before, so that is a consideration. This faction is definitely not going to be for everyone. But if you like the glass cannons type type of of ranged uh, ambushed play, these guys are the one. I have seen Way Watchers absolutely demolish armies in the most disgusting way sometimes, <laughs> and it's simply because they are just so speedy and 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 offer up too many different looks. And then on top of that, they have some amazing, uh, some amazing, some amazing options in cavalry as well. I want to bring them up right now before we actually move on. And these wild ride, these wild riders with shields are are that good. They are that good. They're so damn fast. They can get into enemy back lines. And while you're getting ambushed on one side of the map, these guys are these guys are on the other side of the map doing all sorts of mean and nasty things to your back line, which is very very difficult to deal with. Of course, it does come with its own you know its own micro uh, its its own micro issues. But if you can handle that, if you're the StarCraft type of player. You'll have no problem with that, and these guys will reward you for those skills, of course. And that is why they are number two. And now, for number one, and a little bit of a drum roll here, perhaps, as well. And who could it be other than the Vampire Counts? The Vampire Counts have some of the best, <laughs> the best selection of Legendary Lords, because Vlad Von Karstein, in particular, can not only be a top-tier wizard, but he can also handle his own on the front line. He's a duelist, he can take care of himself, he can take care of the enemy, more importantly, <laughs> and because of their very diverse, maybe not so diverse, but their very powerful uh, access to the Lords of Magic, makes them very, very difficult to deal with because it adds value in a way that's not really shown on the dollars, or sorry, the gold screen right here. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, basically, the reason why the vampire accounts are so can be so powerful is because with their magic combined with their very low tier shaft units that are typically just holding units, they can really elongate the value out of them. And what you know, what is shown as a hundred a hundred gold unit right here, or two, I mean, a two hundred gold for the regiment of renown, or three hundred gold for the skeleton warriors and skeleton spearmen. They can really be made into what should be like a 500 gold type unit because when you start healing them up and buffing them up with your legendary lords, they have so much more staying power. They fight harder and they have so many options to deal with on the other side. So with regards to that, the, the gold spent per gold spent is just better for this faction when you have all these factor combined. Of course, it does bring up some issues with, uh, with micro, but we are assuming that the, you know, the, the skill of these players is about the same and their micro capabilities are our top level these guys are some of the best with that they will certainly reward you for that because these low tier units can hold so damn well it gives them a lot of spending capabilities in other categories where they have some of the best options in the game that would be of course the blood knights with their incredibly powerful cavalry units uh also some flying monsters also just regular monsters of course as well and that is very very difficult for an enemy to plan for the only constant with the vampire accounts is that you know that they're not going to have any artillery or any ranged units but that doesn't really help when you don't know where they're going to be flying from you do know that they're probably going to rush they are certainly one of the better rush factions or perhaps even the best rush faction um but their staying power on the front line really does force the enemy into making these very difficult decisions of okay do i try do i do i put my high tier units against their low tier and it's just to chop through them fast so that we can you know hopefully do something somewhere else on this map or do but that leaves you up to the mercy of their very high cost units like their monsters or their or their dragons in some cases as well or terror guys that's you know that's usually a decision you are a, a decision you don't want to be making and then on top of that they can punish you with very, 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 very nasty magic. And because they almost, I believe all of the legendary lords do have access to some pretty ma uh, to some pretty, pretty powerful magic, you always have to be aware of that as well when playing against them. So they just have so many different tools to deal with the enemy. And because their magic is so powerful in particular, that, that really adds value to their to their lower tier and least and, and lesser costing units they are able to really fill out their ranks do the overwhelm and overpower strategy incredibly well and that just makes them a pain in the ass to deal with but that is also why they are number one now of course there is one more thing that i want to mention here there was one faction that i wanted to include but uh well, I wanted to include them. They're pretty damn good. They do seem to do quite well, but the other three, the other three factions that we already mentioned are are just they're just too damn strong. And that is and that is actually one that's pretty damn similar to the one we're, that we're looking at right now. And that's the Tomb Kings. The Tomb Kings have a lot of what the Vampire Counts have, except they do have a few differences there. Their magic relatively the same, which gives them the same capabilities with their front line, very low cost units, especially the Skeleton Warriors and Skeleton Spearmen. Holy fucking moly! They get they get their staying power increased immensely by a few buffs from their legendary lord but where also the tomb kings do a lot a, a lot of damage is of course their ranged capabilities with their very powerful artillery and very uh unique artillery as well the bone giants and of course the screaming uh skull catapults and then the casket of souls all all great units um but they also have they also have armor piercing very long ranged units with the Ushtbashti, I can't say it, but you know which one I'm going after. They're, they're these guys right here, actually. If I can find them really, really quick, let's see exactly where they are. Yes, there they are. There they are. The Ushbashti, or butchery names once again. Sorry. <laughs> so they can snipe out targets very, very well as well. And because they do have a lot of options with regards to their speedy units and their constructs, you can fill out your ranks with a lot of these low, key, low cost, low tier units. They will be serviceable and hold in the front line relatively well. And then you can punish them with high cost constructs, you know, elsewhere or pound them with artillery, which means that there's a lot of versatility in the way that you can play them. So you can draw the enemy into into being more aggressive and making more decisions or you can also play more defensively yourself and just pound them with your very powerful artillery and you usually will have range on them as well and they can do both those styles 
pretty damn, pr very, very effectively. Not only that, they have some very good options for cavalry and some very unique options for cavalry as well especially with these guys right here, if I can find them really quickly. Yes, they are. Necropolis Knights, some of the most interesting units in the game. And also the Suproach Coal Stalkers, all very good units. So they have a lot of different tools to deal with, a lot of different just, uh, diverse situations. And more importantly, they make, you, they make the enemy think, what are they going to bring? What are they going to bring to this battle? Are they gonna, do, I, do I need to plan for a bunch of constructs? Do I need to plan for a bunch of artillery coming at me? Do I need to plan for some very sneaky and nasty cavalry type ambushing units? It's, 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 it's always a toss up. So with that said, I think that'll do this video. I'll run through it one more time very quickly. Number three, Dark Elves. Number two, Wood Elves. Number one, Vampire Counts. And the honorable mention, as we just looked at, the Tomb Kings. I hope this one serves you well, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.